Next week, we'll be back with three more DIY disasters. I'll be wherever you decide to send me, and Nick will be bringing home improvement salvation to Bolton. Now it's time to say goodbye from everybody in South End. Say goodbye, chaps. Goodbye, Bye. chaps. Bye. If DIY is giving you a headache and you need help, why not join Bob the Builder and our designer Bridget for a live online chat. They're available to answer your questions now and until 10 tonight at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash DIY SOS. You must have heard of Gatsby's parties. Gatsby? What Gatsby? Experience the glamour. Do you know where Mr. Gatsby is? This is uh, Daisy. We've met. Passion. Daisy doesn't love you. She's never loved you. She loves me. And the tragedy of the great Gatsby. The only reason she married you was because I was too poor and she was tired of waiting. Mira Savino. Oh, please, let's get out of here. And Toby Stevens. In her heart, she never loved anyone except me. BBC Films presents The Great Gatsby. Tomorrow at 9.30 on BBC One. Who'll fight your corner if you end up sharing your holiday hotel with the builders? And who'll find an airline that loves your children as much as you do? Watchdog. The consumer's best friend for holidays, sport and leisure. Weekend Watchdog. Fridays at 7 on BBC One. When the ape man met modern humans, the epic story of evolution reaches a crisis point on BBC Two now. Here on BBC One, the BBC News with Peter Sissons. It's nine o'clock. The Home Office rejects proposals to liberalise Britain's drugs laws. The possession of softer drugs, including ecstasy, will stay a serious offence. Another deadly avalanche in Austria sweeps 11 skiers to their deaths. And the babes in the wood, a man has been charged 30 years after their murder. Good evening. The government today rejected out of hand much of a report designed to take a fresh look at Britain's drugs laws. The independent report, partly funded by the Home Office, argued that the police waste too much time on soft drugs and that the toughest penalty should be aimed at hard drugs and organised traffickers. The report recommended that offences involving the use of ecstasy, LSD and cannabis should all be downgraded in seriousness. But the Prime Minister, the Home Office and the Drug Supremo insisted that would send out all the wrong signals. A grandmother with four children of her own. This woman may seem an unlikely drug dealer, but that's exactly what the law branded her when she was sentenced to 15 months in jail. She was arrested with two ounces of cannabis she was sharing among friends. Despite the experience, she continues to smoke the drug. She says many others are doing the same. It's certainly not people on the fringe of society alone. Um, I think most people will admit that they either smoke or have smoked or know somebody that smokes cannabis in their immediate family these days. Despite record drug seizures, there's little evidence that suppliers are drying up. Now, after a two and a half year investigation, an inquiry set up by the Police Foundation concludes that the law is a limited deterrent. It calls for reduced penalties for some drug users. It says people found in possession of cannabis, ecstasy or LSD should not be sent to prison, while possession of cannabis should not be an arrestable offence at all. A new offence of drug dealing would target those who profit from illegal drugs. What we're concerned to do is to minimise the harm that we believe the current law itself produces, which is to criminalise large numbers of young people who are otherwise law-abiding early in their lives with detrimental effects on their future careers. But within hours of its publication, two key recommendations were rejected. On a visit to a treatment programme in Brighton, the government-appointed drug czar reflected the view of both the Prime Minister and the Home Office that so-called soft drugs would not be reclassified. 
The government's reaction to the recategorization of ecstasy and cannabis is that it cannot support that. It sees no benefit in doing that. Uh, these laws were reviewed relatively recently in terms of the categorization, and I don't think that that would help. But among the wider population, drug use is becoming increasingly common. In London's city bars, many know of people regularly taking drugs. I think it is quite widespread, especially in certain industries, I'd say, advertising. I'm not just saying pinpoint in certain industries, but I would say it's quite widespread. I think it's probably more widespread than you'd expect it to be, especially um, low-class drugs as opposed to BC-class drugs rather than obviously the half off. Though the government's rejected two of the main recommendations in the report, there are 79 others, and they've been made by key members of the establishment. Many in the cabinet privately agree that drug dealing should be targeted more than use. But with an election within sight, the government doesn't want to be seen to be softening its approach on drugs. Karen Allen, BBC News, Westminster. At least 11 people have died and two are missing after an avalanche at a skiing resort in Austria. It happened in Caprun, southwest of Salzburg, this afternoon. Rescuers say the skiers were buried under a wall of snow. Jonathan Charles reports from the scene. A brief moment of hope. Rescue workers pull a survivor out of the snow. But most of the rest of the skiing party weren't so lucky. The group of Germans, Austrians and Czechs were buried beneath a wall of snow half a mile long and 150 meters high. There was no chance of escape. The emergency services were at the scene quickly, alerted by a woman who managed to dig herself out of the snow and then was able to call for help using her mobile phone. One shot survivor said the avalanche had struck without warning. The whole group was up there. The whole group was up there and we were going down one by one. One group was already down and waited for the others to come down too. Then one of our group went a little bit to the side and then the avalanche went off. The avalanche left a trail of destruction snaking down the mountain. Blocks of snow are all that remain of what was a devastating force. The avalanche follows several days of heavy snow. But as the weather had become warmer, the snow had started to melt and became unstable. Helicopters are being used to search the area, but there's little chance of finding anyone else alive. The avalanche has occurred just as many skiers from Britain and the rest of Europe are heading here for the Easter holidays. The authorities say more avalanches can't be ruled out. With the rescue efforts continuing here tonight, avalanche warnings will remain in place for the foreseeable future. British skiers and others heading for the Austrian slopes will be asked to take extra care requested not to indulge in activities which are likely to trigger further avalanches. Jonathan Charles, BBC News, Capra. Here, the Northern Ireland Secretary, Peter Mandelson, has said that the peace process is teetering on the brink of collapse. He was speaking before meeting Sinn Féin and SDLP delegations in a new round of talks at Stormont. In Dublin, the Irish Prime Minister, Bertie Ahern, said there was little hope of the IRA decommissioning their weapons by the May deadline set out in the Good Friday Agreement. The Northern Ireland Secretary was addressing pupils at one of Belfast's most prestigious grammar schools. And what he had to say was a statement of what has become glaringly obvious, that the Good Friday Agreement is about to collapse completely. Those windows that have been opened and those opportunities that have been created are in danger of closing and of being extinguished now. I think we are on that cusp, I think we are on uh, that brink and we can go one way or the other. It's decision time for everyone. So, uh, I'm not In the Irish I'm Parliament, the Taoiseach was just as bleak about the prospects for progress. So, uh, it's his firm view that the agreement's strong deadline strong of May the 22nd yes. for the completion of decommissioning of weapons cannot and will not now be met. But we're realistic. Uh, and we know that there's not a hope of us achieving that. Uh, and that's the view of all of the pro-agreement parties and, and the two governments. Uh, we are not uh, see getting any support um, for that position. Both governments know the situation is fast approaching the irretrievable stage. In another major speech later tonight, Mr Mandelson will appeal to both unionists and republicans to compromise. 
There appears little, indeed no chance of that, and the window of opportunity he spoke of is closing fast. Dennis Murray, BBC News, Belfast. Prince Charles played host to some of Europe's leading chefs today in an attempt to persuade them that British beef is safe. They were treated to a traditional roast lunch and a tour around a beef farm. The Prince told his guests he welcomed the European Union's decision to lift the ban on British beef and said he hoped France would now follow suit. This was a tour aimed primarily at people on the continent. Prince Charles showed some of the world's best-known chefs around the Gloucestershire farm to highlight measures now in place to eradicate BSE. He didn't hide his disappointment that the French are still refusing to allow British beef in, though every other country in Europe has officially lifted the ban. Now that Germany has also lifted the ban, we are looking forward to trade beginning there too. And our hope is that France will, will review its position. But the level uh, the levels of trade are nowhere near what they were before the BSE crisis. The Prince explained how cattle like these can now be traced back to birth to prove they're BSE free. The French chefs were impressed. What I see today is very, uh, very reconforting for me and uh, I, it's a real chance that uh, that's the, the things are going well now here and uh, I hope that uh, the, the position of France will be reconsidered uh, later on. Absolutely stunning. One UK restaurateur says it's foreign consumers who must now be convinced. Raymond Blanc is tonight cooking a beef dinner for the visiting chefs at his Michelin starred restaurant in Oxfordshire. Everything about it, everything is traceable, so I feel very confident. And the consumers should now feel confident. It is perfectly okay to eat beef. This is Prince Charles trying to reach directly to consumers on the continent. But it's a hard task. Since the ban was lifted by most countries seven months ago, only a handful are actually buying British beef. Margaret Gilmore, BBC News, Morton in Marsh. Tony Blair has set out his definition of what it means to be British. He said British identity was now built on the values of creativity and tolerance, and devolution in Scotland and Wales had strengthened rather than weakened the United Kingdom. The Conservatives accused the Prime Minister of disliking British traditions, institutions and its currency, and said he was trying to get rid of them all. At this South London flag factory, sales of the Union emblem are falling. But with the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly up and running, there's increased demand for the Scottish, Welsh and English flags. Today, Labour and the Tories renewed their arguments over devolution, each seeking to claim the mantle of the patriotic party. At a lunch in London, Mr Blair argued that change and modernisation were creating a sense of national identity. True patriotism lay not in unchanged institutions, but in shared values. We can see devolution as a necessary part of keeping Britain together. More regional decentralisation in England makes sense. City mayors with real power have their place. Hereditary peers in the House of Lords don't. And a constructive, engaged attitude to Europe reflects the best of British values of openness and leadership in the world. William Hague argues that devolution will lead to Britain's breakup. In Birmingham tonight, on the latest leg of his Save the Pound tour, he accused Mr Blair of constitutional vandalism. If he has suddenly discovered this concept of Britishness, why does he want to abolish the pound? Why does he want to sign away more and more of the rights and powers of this country to Europe? And why has he now left us with this constitutional mess of having a Scottish Parliament and a Welsh Assembly, but no fair representation for the people of England? Though the Tories won't reverse devolution, Mr Haig says he would give English MPs exclusive say over laws that affect only England. The Liberal Democrats want devolution to go further. We can't just stop here. You have to keep devolving power now within the regions of England. And if you want to maintain Britishness, you have got to regionally within England give people in the different regions the same sense of ownership and belonging as, for example, the Scots, the Welsh and the Northern Irish have already. The Nationalists are accusing the Prime Minister of running scared. Blair's losing control and this is a panicky speech. He's panicking at the implications of his own policy. And now three quarters of folk in Scotland regard themselves as Scottish rather than British. And Tony Blair, you know, waving the flag, the Union jacket, people in Scotland ain't going to cut any ice. Politicians of all parties seek from time to time to cloak themselves in the flag. Mr Blair did it coming into Downing Street as an election victor. 
The Tories regularly end their conferences in a red, white and blue fervour. Devolutions proved a bumpy road for the government, so Mr Blair's pinning the patriotic label on every aspect of his modernisation programme and his European policy. The Tories, who plan a save the pound election, insist he's raised a subject to suit them and say they're the real party of Britain. You can tell an election's getting closer. Robin Oakley, BBC News, Downing Street. BMW has revealed how much the Rover Car Group cost to keep afloat last year and insisted that the huge losses left it with no choice but to sell it. The BMW chairman, Joachim Milberg, said Lo Rover lost £730 million, or about £2 million a day. He denied that the British government had been kept in the dark about the mounting crisis. It's tough to sell a Rover car these days, however hard you polish. At the Viking dealership in Southampton, sales have fallen to half their normal level since news of the Rover sell-off broke. Like 300 other Rover dealers, staff here face an uncertain future, and there's considerable anger at BMW, who are widely blamed for marketing a good product badly. The Rover product is better now than it probably ever has been, and it is such a tragedy that uh, uh, BMW have decided at this crucial time uh, to withdraw their support for Rover. I'm desperately sad about that. In Munich today, the BMW board was besieged by camera crews as it met to explain the company's worst ever results. The purchase of Rover has been a disaster for BMW. The company says British reluctance to buy British cars has played its part. We are very sorry that uh, it was not able to achieve the turnaround due to certain circumstances. One point uh, is the weakness of the Rover brand. The, uh, uh, the new products were not so successful, in particular in the, in the Great Britain market. Today's figures describe the sheer scale of the failure of BMW's Rover division. On its own brand cars, BMW made a healthy profit of £1.3 billion. But on Rover models, losses were 732 million, added to which a further 1.9 billion pound loss will be incurred, shedding the Rover operations. Back home, the Trade and Industry Committee travelled to the West Midlands, where 10,000 Rover jobs are at risk, and many more could go amongst component manufacturers. It will be extremely painful, extremely difficult. And in the worst case scenario, there will be a lot of redundancies because we can't avoid it. Rover unions will be back in Munich this week. They're desperately hoping to find a buyer for Rover cars to rival the bid from Alchemy, a British investment firm that plans to cut production dramatically. But BMW said today there's no other offer on the table. Peter Morgan, BBC News. The government is understood to be planning sweeping changes to the way new cars are sold, forcing manufacturers to cut prices by up to a third. The move is aimed at bringing car prices into line with the rest of Europe. The Consumers Association launched a website today offering new cars at European prices, with an average saving of between three and four thousand pounds. Britain's banks and building societies have voted to stop charging customers twice when they use the cash machines of a rival group. Members of the Link Network say double charging will end in July, but non-customers will still be charged once for the use of the rival machine. A man has been charged with the murders of two children 30 years ago in what came to be known as the Babes in the Wood case. The bodies of 11-year-old Susan Blatchford and 13-year-old Gary Hanlon were found in Epping Forest in Essex in 1970, 11 weeks after they disappeared. Ronald Jebson, who's 61, was remanded in custody today by magistrates in Brent. The police investigation began in March 1970, when the two children disappeared from their homes in North London. They were last seen playing in the street. Officers questioned hundreds of people and searched a wide area for clues. At the time, there was speculation that Susan Blatchford, aged 11, and Gary Hanlon, who was 13, had run away together. But then their bodies were found 11 weeks later in a copse on the edge of Epping Forest, just a mile and a half from where they lived. The coroner at their inquest recorded an open verdict because scientific tests in the 70s couldn't tell if the pair had been killed or died from exposure. The case was reopened in 1996 by detectives here at Scotland Yard after they received fresh information. 
With the permission of her parents, they exhumed the body of Susan Blatchford last year and carried out further forensic tests. Now, 30 years on, Ronald Jebson, who's 61, has been charged with the murders of Susan Blatchford and Gary Hanlon. He's due to appear in court next month. Peter Hunt, BBC News. Seven players and officials from Leicester City Football Club have been given heavy fines by the Football Association over the distribution of tickets for last year's Worthington Cup final at Wembley. The FA said the men either deliberately gave tickets to fans from the opposing team Tottenham Hotspur or were so careless with them that they ended up in the wrong hands anyway. The former England international Tony Cotty left the FA hearing tonight, clearly unimpressed with a fine of £12,500. We, we've issued a statement, so please refer to the statement, but I'm very disappointed, very disappointed. The inquiry tribunal imposed an even bigger penalty on Cotty's teammate Andy Impey. He's been fined £20,000 after it emerged his personal allocation of tickets had found its way into the hands of rival Tottenham supporters. Closed circuit video captured these violent scenes at the tunnel end of Wembley, supposedly reserved for Leicester fans, as segregation arrangements broke down. We expect players as, as well-paid, responsible adults to uh, deal with their tickets properly and uh, not hand them out in the, in the careless way that's, that's, that's clearly happened in, the, in these cases. As a police investigation continues into the crowd trouble, the Leicester players and officials penalised for irresponsible ticket distribution said they were aggrieved at the FA's action. At no stage prior to the distribution of the tickets were those involved warned that the supply of even one ticket to a Tottenham Hotspur supporter would deemed to be misconduct. Despite the outcome of today's hearing, it's by no means the end of a saga which has been dragging on for more than a year. All the players and officials from Leicester who've been found guilty today have signalled their intention to appeal. But any new hearing is likely to be many months away. Paul Newman, BBC News, at the Leicester Ticket Inquiry. The Queen is visiting Tasmania, where she's been given the most enthusiastic welcome yet on her two-week tour. She and the Duke of Edinburgh were greeted by more than 10,000 people who lined the streets of the capital Hobart. In November's referendum, 62% of Tasmania's population voted to keep the monarchy. Eleven days into the tour and the crowds are getting bigger. 12,000 people turned out in Hobart today. But as the Queen of Australia makes her way around her realm, the debate about whether to replace her as head of state is still raging. This is the nation's first chance for eight years to see her in person. And scenes like this, with the Duke taking personal charge of some of her younger admirers, are playing well. By definition, most of these people are monarchists. Others are simply curious. Either way, it's a big event in this part of town. But away from the Royal Roadshow, it's a different story. Families enjoying a quiet lunch hour in a nearby park could see no reason to stir. And as the Queen's entourage passed by over the Tasman Bridge, they hardly troubled to look up. I don't see that she plays much of a role as far as I'm concerned she could be 